Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week we head into the Angus Glens with Highland stalker Andy Malcolm, who shows us how to tackle red hinds and perform an effective gralic. Back in Glenesk, Byron follows stalker Andy Malcolm as he gets through his hind cull. The first port of call is a quick check of zero. With the bullets finding their mark to his satisfaction, Andy heads off to his first spying point out on the hill. We've come up to a vantage point here, I uh, can see a good lot of ground. Um, I'm picking up a few little groups of deer, but they're all way far out. Um, this this mild weather, a uh, combination of mild weather, a lot of west winds, and uh, pressure shooting has, has drawn all the deer onto the far limits of my ground. Uh, which means a lot of time getting out to them and a lot of time bringing them home. Um, but I think the biggest problem today is going to be missed. Uh, I can see this, it, it's, it's like a front uh, starting many, many miles over this way and it's just, it just stretches across, you know, sort of about 180 degrees of vision. Um, it's, it just seems to be rolling in and I reckon uh, a lot of this ground is going to be blotted out in five or ten minutes. Starting with, with safety first, um, here's my personal beacon uh, which I can activate if, uh, if something happens to me and uh, I can't get in touch with anybody on the radio. Um, here's the radio itself. Um, this is uh, primarily for getting in contact with my ponyman to, to get them to, to come to extract the deer. Um, in here I have a uh, a spare strap for, for making a drag rope out of, a spare knife, spare battery for the radio, uh, a small torch and some tape for um, uh, putting onto a beast uh, in case I, th I think I'm going to have trouble finding it again. Uh, so it all gets put away in the top pocket here. Uh, then I have my drag rope, gravelking knife, most important, some antibacterial hand gel, and then for my personal comfort, a pair of Gore-Tex mitts, a set of waterproof leggings, which I think I'm going to need today. If it looks like it's going to stay dry, they'll often get left behind. A waterproof shell, and most important, sandwiches and a flask of tea. Driving as far out as he can, Andy occasionally stops and spies en route across the distant hills in an effort to locate Hines. The day looks to be turning already, so he wants his beasts in the larder as quick as possible. The deer are not far from us now, just over this rise, um, about probably still 300 yards away, but uh, from here on it's going to be extreme caution. Um, the thing you have to remember about these deer is that because of the numbers we have to get um, they've experienced a lot of shooting already. We've, um, we've been, now been shooting for two or three months and they're as wild as sparrowhawks. Um, the, the difficulty here is that I'm going to be on the skyline to them so I'm going to have to take extreme care um, coming over uh, to see if I can get a shot. The other difficulty might be that um, it's quite a blind place and uh, I might not be able to see a lot of the deer, they, they might just be at periscope depth, uh, it might just only be heads that I'm seeing. Uh, from uh, my first spy I saw that there are also hares and sheep around on this face, so all in all it's just not going to be straightforward. Everything is on course until some unexpected visitors derail the stalk. I'm 
get forced off my route, uh, my chosen route because of these sheep. Um, not terribly far away from the deer. I'm just around the brae here someplace and uh, my real concern now is I'm going to end up eyeballing them to eyeball with the, the deer. But uh, if, I, if I move these sheep it'll be game over anyway, so I just have to do what I have to do. It's too late and the deer are spooked. Because we were having to come round these sheep at the top of the brae, um, I had to come down onto the face earlier than I wanted to and uh, unfortunately there was a, a young stag and a stag calf obviously being pushed out of the group by a, a dominant stag the, the rut is you know, just at the last stages but um, anyway they, they, were, they were lying separate from the group they spotted us and they've, they've, um, they've, they've crossed the burn onto the other side of the glen and taken the whole lot with them so it's back to square one And he has no choice but to follow the deer down the glen and along the burn. Encouragingly, in the distance, good numbers of deer show themselves through the mist. At least there are no sheep out here. a group of deer up this burn on the, the left hand side where they are is uh, a position where they can look down a, a good stretch of the burn um, but what's in our favour is that uh, visibility is getting really sort of quite poor uh, the downside is well, I'm going to have to be very careful about a shot um, I might be forced to, uh, to take a next shot everything up above us here is on the skyline uh, and our problem is I've only got uh, about a half a dozen beasts to choose from. Uh, I don't think there are any yelled hinds there. And uh, I don't have come all this way just for a calf. Uh, I've just spotted be some way out to the right. Um, it's still in range, but uh, much further right. Um, so I'm just going to get the rifle out now in case there's something there that's going to shoot. With a group located against a peat hag, Andy carefully loads and deploys his rifle. The swirling winds can cause a lot of problems up here, so Andy has to be very careful. With beasts being shot at every day of the season, they soon get wise to mistakes. Wisely, Andy waits for the right animal to take. Despite watching for some time, he can't find the beast he wants. Eventually they move off. Tough luck, but that's hill stalking. Getting back into another parcel of hinds, this time Andy manages to find a suitable animal. There's a couple of heads up and they're looking down this way, slightly to our right, but um, they would catch any movement if we tried moving just now, so I'm just not going to push it. Just see them against a hag here. It's not an easy shot, but as a professional out on the ground every day, Andy is confident in taking it. The carefully placed next shot drops it on the spot. Job done. Well, that was a really s tricky situation. Um, the deer were grazing into a hollow. We were pinned down with um, those stags at the back of the group. Um, I couldn't get on top of the bump here because um, the, st the stags were, were already seeing the top of my, my head moving around. So I come around the side of the bump. Um, the deer were going into the hollow, by the time they'd come out of that hollow they'd be out of range. Visibility is deteriorating all the time. Um, I hope I've made a, a good choice. I've, I've shot one in the neck with a, a good big hag as a backdrop. So I'll go and find out. Well there's our prize after all that work. After checking the beast over, Andy completes a quick hill grelic. We will see more of that later in the show.
Carcass extraction will be done by the Garen. Not only is it the most efficient way to get beasts off the hill, it's also got a strong tie with stalking tradition. There's just time to try for hind number two. It doesn't take long to get it, but unfortunately the camera can't capture the shot. Nonetheless, another beast is down and it's time to call it a day. Again, the hind comes off the hill via the Garen, marking an end to a successful day's hill stalking completed in the time-honoured Highland way. Well, that's two hinds closer to completing the cull, and now, the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. Olympic gold medalist Peter Wilson and GB team manager Ian Coley have been named in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. Both will receive MBEs later in the year for their services to shooting. Ian claimed he was humbled by the award and that it was great for the sport of shooting. Tim Newnham, British Shooting's Performance Director, saw the awards as fantastic recognition for two of the sport's great ambassadors. Scottish National Heritage has revealed the amendments it will make to the 2013 Scottish General Licence. Following its annual consultation, SNH stated that this year's changes represent a significant improvement on earlier policies. The Ruddy Duck has been added to General Licence 1 and the Canada Goose to General Licences 1, 2 and 3. With the correct Scottish General Licence, lethal methods of control may be used on these non-native birds throughout the year to control their numbers. Details on which traps can be used under General Licences 1 to 4 have been simplified and by hand has been added to the General Licence for dispatching or capturing target animals. British Shooting has received a 21% funding increase from UK Sport for the Rio 2016 cycle. £3 million will be made available to British Shooting, enabling Shooting to build upon Peter Wilson's achievement in London. Sport England has also announced over £1 million in support of British Shooting's plan for 2013 to 2017 to help the sport develop both disability shooting and talent pathways. Increasing roe deer populations are affecting woodland ecosystems, says a study carried out by Durham University and the Food and Environment Research Agency. The study, the first of its kind to concentrate just on roe deer, highlighted a correlation between increasing roe numbers and decreasing shrub diversity and cover. It also warned of the knock-on effect of overgrazing on woodland ecologies and suggested landowner partnerships over large areas were the best way to reduce deer damage. Boxing Day saw around 300 hunts and a quarter of a million people come together to enjoy the iconic and traditional day of hunting. Despite this turnout, any hope that hunting with dogs will be legalised again in time for Boxing Day 2013 look unlikely to be fulfilled. Environment Secretary Owen Patterson informed The Telegraph there would be no imminent vote on the hunting ban as popular opinion in Parliament is still against repeal. Mr Patterson told the paper, it would not be my proposal to bring forward a vote we were going to lose. That was the Shooting Show News. And now, a step-by-step -step guide to Gralicline on the hill, courtesy of our resident Highlander, Andy Malcolm. Every time we put a beast away for human consumption, we sign a declaration that uh, states that we consider that it is fit for human consumption. Uh, and the process of deciding that starts even before you pull the trigger. Um, when you're looking through the, the herd of deer, you're looking for any abnormal behaviour, any signs of illness in, in amongst the animals. Um, all the beasts that we were in amongst look perfectly healthy. Uh, we've now come up to the beast, it's lying on the ground here. I've pulled its head round so the blood is draining uh, to the front of the chest. But I've just given it a once over, I've, um, I've checked the, the hooves, uh, the body, there's no sign of um, any disease or illness. Um, she's just a, a fine looking hind. Usually if there are any signs of illness at, at all, uh, it's quite obvious. Um, we can we can check the, the mouth and the hooves for uh, ulcerations, anything like that, which might indicate foot and mouth. Um, but this this hind's looking perfectly all right. So now we're going to start the gralach. Right, um, you have two choices. One is to, to use uh, rubber gloves. The other is to use antibacterial hand wipe, which is what I'm using here just now. 
Right, the first step is to bleed the animal. So we get the, it lying with its, its face down the hill, its, its chest down the hill. Try and draw both the front legs back so that, so that um, the, the skin over the, the bleed tool isn't going to be stretched one way or the other. You find the keel of the chest and just up from that you can feel a, a sinew that runs up the middle of the neck. That's where you want to put the knife in. I'm enlarging the hole slightly to, to make sure it's getting all the blood out of the, the chest. And I'm also pumping the heart. It means if there's any blood left in the, the, the veins and arteries, stimulating the heart should get it, it pumped out. Cutting the, the, this cut in the bleed hole does two things. One is it lets any hemorrhaged blood out of the chest cavity if it's been shot in the chest. And the other thing is it, it uh, severs some of the, the main blood vessels so you can get the, the blood out of the... the the veins and arteries. Then I'm going to scrape the meat. I'm going to scrape the meat off the esophagus so I can tie a knot in it. If you don't scrape the meat off, the knot won't hold. And you notice I'm scraping it only one way. If you scrape the meat towards the head end, when you try and tie, tie your knot, the meat will just end up sliding back over the, the length of the, the esophagus. And I'm going to cut this esophagus as high off, high up as I can, which gives me enough to play with to get just a simple granny knot slid up the pipe and that's going to hold fine. Right, the next step is to grow it. It should all be able to, to be done from the back here. I, tr I see the centre line on the, on the belly and I just cut in enough to get into the cavity very carefully. Hook two fingers in and cut right down to near about the, the pelvis and cut up to reach the bottom of the sternum and then reach in and ease the rumen backwards as well as out to one side and I'm separating the spleen from the, the top of the rumen as I go Just keep easing it out, making sure there's nothing snagging it. Separating the spleen. And at this stage, I can reach forward and I can feel where the esophagus goes through the diaphragm. My fingertips here have been separated, separated away from the rumen. It's totally intact. And if I reach forward from that, I can see where the esophagus goes through the diaphragm. I'm going to put my fingers around the back of that and draw it through the diaphragm. And there you can see the knot stopping all the, the contents here from spilling out into the chest cavity. From this point, it's just a case of working from the forwards back, separating, gently separating the, the intestines from their mounting on the, the liver. Just pulling everything, working backwards and out. And the final stage should be to clear the, the, the droppings from a, a stretch of the back passage before snapping off the back passage. And that's a good clean growl. I've now piled the, the guts into a, a hollow here. I've placed the rumen on top. And the final stage is to open up the rumen, spread out the contents so it just merges in with the, the vegetation roundabout so we don't leave unsightly piles of guts lying all over the place. In a, in a, a week or two, that'll just be a, a, a mat of, of vegetation. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. We're out every Monday, 7.30pm UK time. This is The Shooting Show.